This is special episode number four about cultural beliefs around pain, the future of treatment of pain and prevalent myths about pain with the one and only Gregory Lehman. Stærk og smertefri er podcasten for dig, som vil lære mere om styrketræning, smerte, kost og sundhed på en nuanceret måde uden magiske løfter. Jeg er din vært, Jakob Bermann fra Maxa.dk, og jeg håber, at du vil nyde denne episode. Welcome to this uh, special episode of uh, Strong and Pain-Free. It will be in English, as my guest is uh, no other than Gregory Lehman. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks for coming. So we've met a couple of times. Yeah. I think the first time was in Sweden in 2015, where Stockholm, yeah. we went to your course and enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I've learned a lot from going to your courses and talking to you. So now it's a, an honor to have you here. So I th- think before we go into talking more about pain and I want to talk about cultural beliefs around pain and some of the lookout for f- of your point of view around how pain and treatment of pain will be in the future. I think we could go maybe into a short presentation of who you are and what you do. My presentation? Yeah, I have presentation. to present myself? <laughs> like a short one. <laughs> oh, I should have written something. Uh, no, my uh, I'm a physio, or what, what do you guys call it here? Like mm-hmm. a physical therapist mm-hmm. out of Toronto. I'm also a chiropractor, but I've let my license go because there's no point in, in being both. Uh, I was a chiro first before I was a physio. Before I went to chiro school, I did a master's in spine biomechanics. Before that, it was exercise biomechanics and physiology and so i see patients and then for the past uh five years i've been going around uh teaching biomechanics pain yeah. injuries when does it matter and yeah questions yeah. like that i like to ask you know uh questions to figure out you know what's the the, the best way to practice to figure out what i know and what we don't know and you know what uh what's good for people in pain so you know i don't think biomechanics is irrelevant some people might go that far earlier in their career they get a little disillusioned because maybe mm. the biomechanical approach they taught is you know not well supported so then they freak out and go too far and be like yeah. fuck this shit like a pendulum swimming too far yeah at an individual level i wouldn't say it swung very far at a like a social professional level no. but i think at an ind- individual level you know we always have extremes and all those things but professionally i don't think the pendulum swung too far away from the biomedical model that's for no. sure uh, and i think that's one thing we could get back into but uh, maybe one thing we could start with uh, which at least uh, sometimes i feel is a funny place to go would be like a personal story with pain either like a personal story for yourself or maybe sometimes you've written with the Lehman uh, Institute of uh, your tri- children experiencing oh. some kind of pain or injury. the Lehman initiative <laughs> yeah that's just a joke that's just I know. <laughs> uh, uh don't, not I don't know I say like one out of ten people don't get it oh, okay <laughs> my my three-year-old that's the, I, I first shot a video with her just making fun of her walking I don't know what I did but we just watched it the other day because she wanted she's egocentric and she wanted to see herself <laughs> on on video but so I, that's just like a three or four minute video making fun of all the biomechanical ideas that people say And my kids were watching it and they thought it was absurd and i said everything i said in here uh, are things that therapists have said with sincerity <laughs> nothing <laughs> nothing was like just made up mm. maybe a few things but primarily some of the stuff like when you take a if you do a squat or you you drive with your hip you have to suck your femur <laughs> into your acetabulum as if you could do that and turn on your flexor halcus longus and not your tibialis posterior that type of shit when you run Anyways, uh, uh, so what, what was it with that? <laughs> so like a personal... Uh... Oh, oh, oh. My, a personal experience. Well, I mean, I've had... I mean, I treat people with persistent pain and I treat athletes. Uh, I'm active. I wouldn't call myself an athlete. But I've had persistent pain uh, things my whole life. I've just dealt with it. Uh, so I can really sympathize. So, so I'm one of the... That's why one of my big messages is like the doing is the fixing or feeling like You have to fix yourself before you start, you know, doing the things that you love has always been an issue for me. Because mm. if I said, like, 
I don't really, I think the last time I saw you, I was training for a marathon mm. and I was probably in pain. And uh, if I just waited to be pain, 100% pain free, I'd never be able to run. Well, right now I'm skateboarding and trampolining a lot. And if I waited to be like, my feet are killing me from, cause I don't really skateboard. So pushing off my left big toe is killing cause all the force dorsiflexion and then plantar flexion from when you push off. So anyways, my, my point there is like, if I waited to be pain free, I'd never be able to do anything. So those are, that's my personal experience with pain. There's always mm -hmm. something. Yeah. And the way I treat it is primarily not graded exposure, but more, um, habituation based exposure where I simply find the fucking thing that hurts and then I get the right dosage and then I adapt to it. It's not yeah. very advanced or, or it doesn't, it's not complicated, but it's helpful. Yeah. But yeah. it can feel complicated doing something you want to do a specific amount of to a lesser extent, even though that's what you need. Uh, yeah, that's it's it's actually a really in some ways, and I do this with my patients. It's a it's a tough sell, and I just got an email from someone yesterday where um, he's been trying to fix his back. You know, for three years he's a cyclist, and I was like, and he's super strong, got super strong, did all these rehab exercises. And I was like, you've done all the work, you've done great exercises, but you don't need to fix anything here. It's not your glutes. Your glutes are turning on all those things that he's been told that they weren't firing. Mm. And I was like, you, it's more your, your back just cause you, he could ride a hundred kilometers, but then he would do it four days in a row and have big flare ups. And then he'd be ruined for three weeks. And then he'd go back down and then he'd get excited mm. and do too much again. And I was like, you can do this. We just have to get the dosage right. And you can slowly build up. And as soon as he got that message, I think as soon as that slow and that, I don't think it clicked immediately, but it took a few weeks or a month. Mm. And then he just kind of wrote, you know what you said, just kind of gave me a break or just made me feel like there was hope here. And now my back feels better, even though you didn't do anything. That's, yeah. that's, that's such what people think. I think that's a message. <laughs> a lot of people within the same direction of treatment would recognize from clients. Mm. So what you, what you said there. So if we uh, kind of go into some of your experiences uh, traveling the world, teaching people about pain, would you say you've learned something specific about cultural differences, teaching in different parts of the world? You, you know what? I, I th we mentioned that earlier and I've thought of that before because we talked about it a, a bit in the class. And I don't think I have because the problem, the problem with like my message is I probably get a self-selected group of people mm. And I think people are already a bit on board with this message, but maybe they're not sure how to apply it yet. Yep. That's the thing. I'm not, I, I rare, I sometimes get invited to big conferences where people might hear me speak who would never have heard of me before, but that only happens like once or twice a year. So I don't, and I think I'm primarily speaking to the Western world anyway, like it's Canada, North America even South America. So most of the beliefs are the same. I think, I think that the model of how things work is, and what the way the internet is, everyone has the same ideas now. So I don't, I'm not seeing a lot of differences. And I know there's differences in how certain clinicians practice across countries, but I'm not seeing it because I'm seeing them. Yeah. yeah kind of the that's same. the problem. Yeah. That's the problem with guys like me, like, or women like me, where you wonder if you're, you want to make an impact. Hence, I believe in like writing blogs and giving stuff away for free. But on a, like a course level, I, I doubt I'm dramatically changing people's views. I might just be helping them out a little bit. Yeah. On the more practical part of it. Have you yeah. changed anything in your own way of educating people, teaching courses based on what you've experienced? Um, it's funny. Like my wife always says like, you should get feedback forms. And I'm like, no, <laughs> she's like, well, why are you so arrogant? I'm not arrogant. Cause either I'm going to get a form that says, oh, it's great. I loved it. Or I'm going to get someone saying, no, this, so someone will look at one thing that I did and say, this was fantastic. Another person will look at the same thing and say they hated it. Yeah. So what, what do you, who, what you who do, do you believe, right? You just have to, to, you know, trust yourself. So it's more like what I try to do is I have themes that I want to get across. It's just finding out like better exercises in the class, mm. you know, or like what's the best way to teach or what's the. Uh, best way for people to retain it. That's why when people, I'm really proud of this, so I'm going to plug myself. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> <laughs> when people take my course now, 
there's an online version, mm -hmm. which is longer than the in-person version, which is weird. Um, but when you sign up for the in-person course, you automatically get the online. And, and I love it because then in, uh, when we take the in-person class, I'm like, I know we went over this fast and you asked this question and I anticipated that you would ask it. That's why we did a whole 30 minute lecture. It's on, you get it online. Mm -hmm. And I, so that's neat. Or like everything we cover in the in-person class, if you forget it, it's online and you have a reference. Like I'm so happy with that. Or now like, or people can buy the uh, online one and then if they hate it, they never have to see me again. But if they like it, they can come take the in-person class and they get to use that as a credit. Makes sense. Toward, I like think it's, compliment. I think it's so good. Like I <laughs> listen to me, it's the best idea I've ever had. I really think that's the, because I hate the idea of fucking everyone's just selling and selling and I'm selling too. I get, I'm not giving this away, but I think you're getting a, a lot for it. Yeah, a lot of value for money and you that's, can repeat it. That's, times. that's yeah. the idea. And people are like, oh, is it only a limited time? And I'm like, well, until I die, that's how long or whatever my web hosting runs out. That's of how course. long you get the course for. <laughs> Makes sense. So I read this article a couple of years ago about why it is so difficult to change cultural beliefs around pain and how the educational okay. system is part of the problem due to evolving so slowly and science getting into practice within maybe 20 years. So it's it's kind of lagged. Uh, and then when I got to the bottom of the article, it was written in the beginning of the 1990s. Yeah. So I was like, oh shit, I thought it was written today because it's, I felt at least it's status quo. How yeah. do you feel about this kind of either lack or an actual development in the cultural beliefs in the Western world around pain? So I, w what I think happens is when you have a topic like pain, which everyone has, it's not like physics where you have a small group of people who have specialized knowledge and, mm. and they're like the gatekeepers. Everyone can have an opinion on pain because everyone gets it. So what will happen is a doctor or a physio or a trainer will give, give an opinion on a topic where it's actually something that they picked up when they're in grade two, mm. like sit up straight at your desk, or they got it in Reader's Digest or just some magazine somewhere. And then they say, well, because I'm a doctor or a physio, uh, I have authority to say this, but if they actually go back and reflect on where they got that knowledge, you realize it's just passed down from their aunt. They just <laughs> think that it's special knowledge because they have a title. Mm. And so that's what happens. So everyone has these opinions. And so they just like keep getting passed around. Like the, the whole idea of like, you need to sit up straight, your physios, like people in school and teachers will teach that. And you actually ask them, where is the research for that? Or like, they'll say a monitor for a computer has to be this high. And they say, I know this because I'm a physio. And I'm like, no, you probably knew that before you were a physio, you just passed it on mm. as being physio based knowledge or something like that. So that's what I think has happened. People just pass on these, whatever the common wisdom is and no one ever actually questions that stuff. And that would be part of the solution, reflecting upon where did the knowledge come that, from? That that would be, everyone has to say, why do I think I know this? Where did this come from? What, what, what why is this? The, like, you know, it's personal training and fitness is the exact th th thing. Like, don't do a pull down with the bar behind your head. Why? Well, well the shoulders will impinge. What, so what do you, huh? So what? Like, what's wrong with pulling something no behind. matter the weight, no matter the range of motion, no matter what I'm used to, no yeah, matter ma my makes mobility no makes no sense makes because no sense. it lacks context. Or like running, like running in knee away, running will wear your knees. Doctors will say that and, and they'll say, I know this because I'm a doctor. Well, what the fuck? What do you actually really know? How You can't make a population-based decision on how knee OA is caused. Like you are an individual person and you see people with knee OA with knee pain and then they might've been runners. You can't make a causation conclusion there yet. They do it and they'll say it's because I'm a doctor or I've worked with runners my whole life. Yeah. I've seen it a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at it from that perspective kind of puts a lot of responsibility on the individual practitioner. Yeah. In what sense could we as a more educational or societal system support that development? Uh, 
I'm not sure about that. I think on an individual level, people have to be willing to say like, I don't know and be really humble mm. and then reflect on again, why they think they know what they know and then go like one example I recommend to everyone is people say, how do you keep up with the literature? And I said, I probably don't. I just choose topics that I'm interested in and then go challenge my bias or, or uh, you know, challenge what I think and try to learn about it. And then I'm a slightly off topic here. I would say there's a lot of research and so much research is just published because someone had to do a master's. They wanted to get into research and it's a neat study. But if you look at it, you have to ask, is spending my time reading this really going to change what I do in practice? Mm. And then you can like, if you, I like JOSBT, but I could probably go and cross out 80% of the articles in some, some editions are fantastic clinically. Some are just great academically, but, but some of those academic stuff is just academic. It's not going to change anything. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta cull, you gotta like, you gotta say how relevant is this and will it change anything? But that's a skill in itself. And I mean, it, it creates yeah. a barrier for how do I get knowledge that I can trust is somewhat true and evidence-based and where yeah. can I found, find it? And yeah, it's hard. No, that's hard. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but I, to me, it's like, and I've been writing about this for years is you have to find your principles. Like if we focus on what the principle say, it's recovery and people mm. getting better, what are really the true principles of recovery? You know, what are the, what are the things that you want everyone to know? And that's how my course is organized that like 10 principles or key messages of pain or recovery. And then it, like, but that's just the way I organize it. You don't have to do it that way. It's just, it just works for me. And then I flesh out the details yeah. there. But I mean, if you go mostly into principles and not into specific interventions that you are kind of married to, you'll also have more freedom. Yeah with different types of clients and paints, if you could say it like that. So uh, looking more into the future in the way we treat pain, are you an optimist or a pessimist on an actual development in an, I don't know, biopsychosocial orientation, or I don't know what we should call it. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a bit of both. I think when it comes to the biopsychosocial, I think all that means is, uh, Pain is super complicated, influenced by a number of factors that interrelate. Mm. We don't really understand. And you could be like um, really daunted by that, or you can kind of say, all right, if it's influenced and caused by a number of factors, that to me means a number of factors can help someone. Mm. And then I have to be open to the idea that the things that I'm good at doing for the people I work with may not be the right thing at that point in time. Mm. So I have to be open to them, you know, getting help with someone else. And then it, I'm not saying that opens you to doing like Reiki or aromatherapy, but it should open you to thinking like, you know, having someone work on their depression and anxiety with the right therapist, or I don't know, relaxation or stress reduction, those things can all, and it, well, how does, how's that going to help my knee pain? And you just sort of have to sell it that it doesn't make sense linear thinking when it's just about stress and load, but it makes sense when you realize how complicated pain is, how it's about the whole system gets sensitized. That's why these things that seem weird can actually carry over and help you. And maybe also why a lot of uh, interventions can work somewhat on yeah. pain, no matter that they don't have any specific effect. Yeah, that that that's the idea. But at the same time with that, gen like I'm very much into like, I don't know if you remember my, my class, but we started with uh, like, when do you need to be specific? It's kind of my, my favorite question. Now I, that's the second thing we do. The first thing I say is like, what are all the good things you can do to help with pain? Meaning what's the the biggest, most general approach you can take? Like how many people in the world would we help if we just did these general mm -hmm. things that are non-specific? And I know therapists hate that because they, they want, we all want to think that we're mechanics and we mm -hmm. like fine tune and diagnose and get this tailor-made intervention. But I actually think like just asking someone, how can you be healthier? or what are the, all the general things you could do, start doing those. What does it take to buy into that? You have to accept that pain is multidimensional. And then, <laughs> wait, hold on. Then you stress that idea where you're like, okay, that's an okay idea, Greg, but where might it be wrong? 
So when do we need to be specific? And that's how I follow it up now. Like, when are the times where just doing these general interventions, when are they not helpful? And then when, mm -hmm. when do we need help? Or when, when does someone need gabapentin or Lyrica or a, a small surgery or some special psychological in intervention or some sort of drug or mm. cream, you know, like getting better at that of when like a general approach isn't enough, but we need someone else. That's the, that's what I challenge myself. Yeah, with because now. working with clients with persistent pain, it seems like the literature is pointing toward a specific exercise or aiming at a specific muscle isn't yeah. <laughs> any better than doing general exercise for the body part. So what would be examples of when we should be more specific? Yeah, so if we stay in that world of exercise, um, you know, I, I would have always said tendinopathy was probably the perfect example of when you need specific. Because the assumption there is like uh, tendinopathy is, it means there's tendinosis. So, so there's some disrepair in the tendon that's disorganized. That might never heal. So our theory has always been, let's build up the capacity around it. It's like a labral tear. You're not going to heal that labral tear, but you build up the system around it to tolerate the labral tear or the knee osteoarthritis or the tendinosis. So I would have said we need specific load on the tendon in order to make the tendon stronger and bigger, which is always stiffer. It needs relatively heavy load, you know, greater than 70% of max, probably at least two or three times a week. So those would be like, that'd be like a specific case. But what's interesting, <laughs> like you know, people probably hate when I say that, people say that with such certainty and yet you'll actually never see a paper where they test that hypothesis. They have one one group that either doesn't get any exercise, so that's just that's a shitty control group, and the other group gets the heavy loading, right? Or some papers, they'll do the heavy loading plus the eccentric loading, which isn't heavy. It's, it's six times 15 reps. Technically, if it's 15 reps, that's less than 70% max, and that group gets better. Mm. And it's amazing that no one says, oh, maybe the tendon doesn't, need to change dramatically yeah. to get out of pain. The fact that the heavy eccentric loading, like the heel drops do just as well as the heavy, um, uh, regular strength training, mm. that kind of challenges the hypothesis that the, that the tendon material properties need to change, mm. but no one points that out except for me. And then, and then <laughs> yeah, I just get, then I get shit on for being a pessimist. I'm like, no, this, this tells you you can be an optimist. This just tells you, you got to do something. Yeah, and I, I think you you would also agree that we've seen this pattern in a lot of different uh, body parts. Like in some studies, one group would change their biomechanics, but the pain wouldn't change. Yeah. Or another group, the pain would change, but the biomechanics would not. And then, of course, for some groups, both would change yeah. or not change. But it seems like it's not correlated to the extent that people would sometimes like. No. Yeah, the kinematic stuff is interesting, like in the shoulder. A lot of papers try to show, try to change scapular kinematics. The people get better, like so that intention led to something good. And then you look at the kinematics, and they haven't changed. Exactly. Right. But there's then there's this one paper by Turgut, and I put it in my course because it says we were able to change the kinematics a little yeah. bit. The other group didn't change their kinematics, but it didn't matter. Both groups got better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic. So, so the only thing I would say with that like to challenge a guy like me say, well, fine, we're treating individuals. Are there instances where you do have to change kinematics or something like that? Or are there instances where that tendon actually does need to get bigger and thicker, mm. right? So maybe there there's a type of tendinopathy and a, and a person who has certain demands in their life mm. where, where we do have to build up, like they could be a basketball player or a skateboarder, someone who puts high loads on the tendon. Yeah. And then that would make sense to me that you got to build sense. it up. But you could also think that it's not the fact that the way they moved before was wrong or harmful, no. but that movement was sensitized. Yeah. If so you just kinematics. changing it yeah. feels better. That's it. Yeah. And then you go back and do it again. So there's a good paper by uh, Leo Ng um, and Peter O'Sullivan's group, the CFT group, where that group itself, the cognitive functional therapy, they were big into changing mechanics and how people move years ago. They had their classification system, less so now, they still do, but they have a paper where they people had pain with flexion. So they said, oh, you have a flexion impairment. 
uh, therefore, and they're rowers, therefore, let's teach you not to flex so much. And uh, the group got better, but when they measured their flexion during rowing, it didn't change. Mm. There's a tiny change during um, sitting. Yeah. So they tried to have people change it. It led to clinical success, but it didn't actually change their kinematics in the long term. Who knows what happened? Like maybe over three weeks Later within that three so weeks. Yeah. So no, no, in the short term, like they might have, because they only measured it at like week oh. one, week six, week yeah. 12. Maybe they changed it for four weeks, felt better and said, oh, fuck it. I don't need to change it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing with studies like that. But okay. but going in this direction, it seems like some of the skills or the role of the cl clinician in a classical sense of being the expert prescribing the one specific yeah. uh, perfect exercise for the individual client, that's not the case anymore. So what would be the role and skills of a great clinician? So uh, if we just stay in the exercise world, I think we're... Um, we're good at habit interruption sometimes. So I think we still have a role of exercise because you'll watch somebody move and they, they might move in a way that keeps aggravating, aggravating them and they don't realize it. Or, and so you just teach them another way to do it. Or if you see them move in a way, um, you, like you, you might have a goal of, you actually might think, we do need to load this part of your body. It's not, it's not getting a stimulus to adapt. And for some reason, that's the part that's like, you're, you're protecting it by accident. You're overprotecting. It's what we all do. So you change how someone moves just to make sure, sure you're stressing that body part. Mm. Um, so that's the, that's someone who's like an, an accidental avoidance person. You like, I don't know, say someone has a knee surgery 30 years ago. And now they have knee pain now. And every time they do a squat, they shift over away from that sensitive side. Mm. And you might think, you know what? My fundamental is sometimes we need to stress a body part to get it to adapt. This person is accidentally protect, protecting it. So we go in and load it up. Or somebody else, this would be the classic Peter O'Sullivan person, is like bracing, guarded, rigid. And we step in and say, why are you lifting like that? Why don't you try lifting like this? Yeah, or sitting or walking. Yeah. That pe so people do. So sometimes people don't realize how, how they move. And so... Sometimes we can change it. So we're like, we're, we're habit interrupters and we teach maybe variety. You could think of it like that, or we just give other ways to load, you know, and then progress. Cause sometimes I, exercises are important. And you, if you think progression is needed, then we got to step in and uh, find the best way to load someone. Or in the biomechanical world, someone's like, I don't want to do any of these exercises. And if, so if you know your exercise as well, you could probably just choose two or three that are the most efficient mm. and then progress them accordingly. Like if someone has a hamstring strain or whatever, tendinosis, and they're just doing glute bridges, right? And squats, that's shitty for the hamstrings, right? If yeah, that's your yeah. goal, right? Wow, your hamstring hurts. Yeah, and I'm a runner. I'm like, that's, you're hardly loading it. We got to really push it. So we still have a job. Yeah, of course, <laughs> to do at least to, to the context of what people are aiming for mm -hmm. or wishing for. What What is the one skill you think many, for example, physiotherapy students think they should be great at, but they don't really need that much focus on? Uh, probably manual therapy or like, or, or like fine tuning exercise prescription based on like EMG. Okay. Like they'll think this person has shoulder pain and there's a little bit of winging. I got to make sure I activate the serratus anterior. So I got to do this fancy push up mm. plus, plus and turn off the upper traps. And I'm like, you know what you could do is just a fucking shoulder raise because that'll get the serratus to fire and the traps fire, but who cares? Yeah. Right. Or maybe you're thinking less about the specific muscle and more about the movement. Yeah. So I'm a bit of, I'm critiquing Ann Cools here, which is odd because I have a lot of respect for her research. I love her rehab programs, but I completely disagree with her rationale. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, elaborate. Which is very much like, um, uh, and I'm, and I, sh I shouldn't. I, I read her stuff, and then after a while, I said, I like it. I like her. I like like her research and like clinical dedication. But it, um, but now, so anyways, they'll choose exercises based on getting like the right coupling of force. Mm. Like you have to get balances, like the force couples in the shoulder that you know. Not too much of this one because then it'll pull the humeral head this way, not mm. too little of that, like that sort of very mechanical. Let's get the shoulder bone in the right position. Let's get the scapula in the right position. So, so choose exercises that do that. And I'm like, who cares? Just like 
train the shoulder comprehensively. Yeah, and to the listeners not knowing, why would that be a, a critique? Are you even? Is it even possible that you are changing the mechanics in that sense that they describe? So, so that's why her, that's why her work is is worthy of respect because uh, she has this idea of how the shoulder should work, and her her whole group tries to test that and find the exercises that satisfy the the balances and progressively do them. So, when I look at her, if I look at her exercise routines and didn't listen to the explanation, I would say that looks like a great program. It's working the entire shoulder. It's slowly building the person up over time. Sometimes you poke into pain and you progress it so that it looks like the goal task that they're having trouble with. And I'd be like, that's fine. But then when I read the discussion, I'm like, oh, but you don't need any of this explanation. Yeah. We're so making it way. Yeah, yeah. The narrative did, isn't necessary. So we, we see that like a lot at most most joints. That um, I think it was Kim Bennell or Kay Crossley. Uh, they wrote a nice article in BJSM about like VMO retraining for the knee versus graded activity. And it, essentially they're like VMO was all the rage or maybe it still is, I don't know. And they're just saying, it's probably the same thing. It's just two different roads to roam. You're just loading up the person and they're adapting and it yeah. doesn't matter. And time goes depending on yeah whether it's more acute or persistent, it makes sense. So uh, do you have any kind of wishes on behalf of future practitioners or current students? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I'm arrogant enough to suggest the future. <laughs> I need more, where's my arrogant hat? Uh, I would, I think we all need to be more humble. Although I just gave like such a strong statement about Ang, <laughs> Ang Cools, but that's coming from like, like more of a side of recognizing ignorance, you know? Mm. And so even with, that's why I, with some of the gang and cool's great stuff. Like I'd say there's lots of different roads to Rome and what we think we're doing, we're probably not. So like, look at what are the common threads? What What's the real mechanism of action of our interventions, mm. right? So when I argue online with people, I'm still recognizing that the stuff that they will do will help. Mm. I'm often just disagreeing with like their rationale yeah. for it. And I'm like, so, how can how can two people look really different the way they practice? Like on the surface, those two people seem at odds and then try to find like the common threads. That's what we should all try to do with our mm. treatments. Like what what why is this person really getting better? And what and and then if we figure out what has to happen for someone to get better, then we can say, well these are all the options. Yeah. And going back to the humble part, being okay with a lot of the times we probably don't know why the thing we yeah. did worked. I mean, it's like like the spine stability stuff with like Stu Stu McGill. I don't buy into the spine stability hypothesis at all. I don't think that people's spines are unstable or that people lack the ability to stabilize their spine. I I think st stability is like breathing. For the most part, you just do it. You don't have to think about it. Yeah, you can change how you breathe. Absolutely. Yeah, you can change the stiffness in your spine. Um, but to stay alive, you don't have to worry about your breathing and have a stable spine. You don't have to worry about stabilizing it. Like, and, but at the same time, I would see, you know, videos of, of him practicing or read an article and I'd be like, yeah, that looks great. He found things that hurt, taught them different ways to move, kept them active, active, gave them exercise and told them that they were safe and they could start playing baseball or football or weightlifting again. Wow. There, there's some great threads and themes in there of good rehab, even though I don't, I, I wouldn't, I don't have to do it the same way. No, but you could do a lot of the same things without the no see big narratives of avoiding flexion, for example. Yeah, sure. But I've definitely told people to avoid flexion before yeah. temporarily. Temporarily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's the difference. Yeah. So that's the debate. That's I wrote an, I wrote a blog. It's like movement optimism versus the kinesiopathological model. And it, it just depends on like how how much faith you have in the ability of a person to adapt. So like if you believe in adaptability a lot, you'd be more want to believe that that avoidance is temporary. If you're really worried about a disc not adapting, then you might say it's you got to avoid flexion for two years. Yeah. So that and that's the crux. It makes sense, especially basing it a lot of that on cadaver research. Yeah, dead 
dead not, not the alive cadavers those no, would be no, weird yeah that's pretty weird so you've studied under um Stuart mcgill a long time ago so a long time ago I, he yeah. wasn't when i was there that was the 90s uh and he was great for taking me on but he wasn't seeing patients so i never saw um that was up till 97 or whatever wait nine, no 99 i never saw him with patients i think that started he might have just started doing that or maybe mm. definitely was doing that more in the 2000s so, what so it wasn't that... very clinic. There wasn't a lot of clinical stuff. It was very, I mean, it still is biomechanical, but you just applied that to people in pain after I was gone. Yeah, so mostly theoretical, like how many flexion cycles do the spine have? Yeah, that was like um, a lot of Jack Callahan's work. I think I would say he was more the leader. Mm. Uh, Stu was the godfather of all that. And then Jack Callahan and then Chad Goyers and all these other researchers and Vanessa Yingling, well, he, she was with Stu. And yeah, that great work there the the debate is whether or not that model is is valid or relevant to a human the yeah. research is exceptional i'm not i wouldn't criticize that what you question is it is is important yeah that's, What's that's the, the crux. is it applicable to a living human being with a nervous system trying to protect us with a an adaptable yeah. body with all the parts going into that so, so in their defense, so like in the 90s, the, I think the thought process would have been that discs don't have a massive capability to adapt. That would still, people would probably still agree with that. But I think over time, we realized that discs do have the ability to adapt. The question is, are, is, are they more like a bone, which is pretty slow, but still or more like a tendon or some other creature mm. where it's not, that's, the, that, there's the crux right, right there. We know they can heal, but remember they don't reverse degeneration, but that's the same thing as a tendon. Mm. You don't reverse tendinosis, but it can heal, you know, and build up. So is a disc a tendon? That's the- Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. So I have a couple of uh, maybe shorter yeah. questions uh, that we could go uh, into. Uh, so what, what are the three biggest mistakes you see people doing in the treatment of pain? Oh, oh, uh, you know what? Uh, good one. I'll, oh God, oh God, how do I say it without like singling out people? You, shit. It's so, um, <laughs> you can do it. I just, I can, cause like, I don't know. I'm like everyone. You're just influenced by like your past few weeks in your life mm -hmm. of like what of patients course. you're seeing and stuff like that. Um, I'm just thinking this is so bad of like, I don't think people are, I don't, honestly, I don't think that people trust, like therapists trust uh, humans' ability to adapt. That's it. I'm, mm. I'm thinking of a few therapists and doctors who were telling patients like, don't do yoga, you know, don't exercise, protect your back. And they gave that message for years. Mm. So I think the rule would be like, we need to like, our, a fun, like, again, one of my key messages or fundamentals of recovery is this, like, we have the capability of adaptability we have the ability mm. to adapt right mm. and it's and and stress the judicious application of stress yep. is what catalyzes that at the same time the other side of that which would be a problem that some of us have including me is that we get caught up in our beliefs and maybe aren't quick enough to back off of that belief and go somewhere else so i've certainly like um, there are times where I'm probably too aggressive, right? And uh, it's taken me a few weeks or months and I said, oh, we need to change tax here. Yeah. Or the person like, I'm thinking of a few patients who, who um, they probably weren't ready for exposure and adaptability and they were asking to back off. And I was, I maybe mm -hmm. could have tried that with them more. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, so you, a difficult balance. Yeah, sometimes sometimes you might be right, but you're going to be wrong. Yeah. If you and like, like you got to meet your patients where you are. Like we can't like everyone wants to change people's beliefs. That's hard. Mm. Not necessary all the time and like and so you don't always have to have not fight. You're not fighting with your patients, but you know, like it's okay to do what your patient wants sometimes. Yeah. Even if you might think otherwise. Makes sense. I know it's hard though. What do you believe to be true within uh, pain that most people disagree with? Um, what? Do I, oh, geez. Uh, you know what? Like it, it, it's the, 
I'm just, I just, it's, I was on Instagram last night. Someone reposted something that I posted like three years ago. It's about posture or something. Mm -hmm. And I was just saying, you know, posture doesn't matter. It's poorly related to pain. And, and then this is where it's hard now because everyone has the lived experience and we do want to hear patients' voices. And they, they said, well, in my lived experience, you know, posture does really matter for pain or something like that. Mm. And so, sorry, what was your question? I wanna, I'm not going to answer your what, question. What do you believe in that most people disagree with? Dis disagree. So I don't know if most people disagree with, but so there's, there's going to be people like that would be something that I believe in. It doesn't really mm. matter about having a good or bad posture. So there'd be a lot of people who would disagree mm. with that because changing their posture has helped them. Yeah. And I don't want to get into arguing with them, but I, but that's because my, our opinions are more nuanced than that. I'm like, no, I don't doubt that if you move differently, yeah. you're going to have less pain. Yeah, and if one movement or lack of movement is painful, yeah. doing something else will maybe feel better. Yeah, it's as simple, as simple as that. So it's like, usually the disagreements that we have, are, it's because people are hearing something in my argument that I'm not saying. Yeah. Right. And I'm afraid when I, if I disagree with people too, I might be hearing something in their argument that they're not hearing as well. So that's not really, that doesn't answer your question, but that. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's still interesting the, because what, what you could say is also that you're probably not questioning whether their change of the posture did feel different, but you're questioning if that's the reason or yeah. if it's because the posture they had before was incorrect or bad yeah. in quotation mark which is probably what they are thinking. Yeah, that's that's the subtle shift. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's nice to tell your patients, you can slouch if it feels better, but by all means, sit up straight if that feels better. Yeah, of Or course. get up and walk, you know. Yeah, context dependent. Yeah. yeah. So what would be your biggest critique of the, in quotation mark, pain science crowd? Uh, you know what, I don't get into that. Like, I don't, because it's not a monolith, so it's really hard. Uh, you know, I. I can actually give a critique more of the people who are against the pain science crowd. I know that. Okay. okay, so the critique of the pain science crowd is that maybe they have to do a bit better job of saying like, of, of telling people what they do, how mm -hmm. they help people, rather than, I mean, there is a, a role of criticism, Yeah. but maybe just saying, well, this is how I apply it and yeah, stuff so like that. So not focusing in too much on all the things that doesn't work the way we thought. Yeah, but you know what? I don't even like, that's not really, again, that's not really their fault. That would just help people like see it just when you look at it, it just looks like I get tired of all the, I don't think the mechanistic debates are helpful and all those things. So that's why I don't even go on Facebook anymore. Although I really like the people having those debates and I have a lot of respect for their mm. intelligence. So that, that'd be, see, that's the thing. Like, I, I don't even know what pain science is. I have it in the title of my course, but I just, it's to me, it's just the spirit. It's the study of pain. Biomechanics is pain science. Of course. Yeah. That's why I meant in quotation. Yeah, I know. I, I know mean, you did. I like you did. also talking about being humble and being okay with not knowing sometimes it's probably a good exercise to looking into what are we focusing too much or too little on. Here, sorry, I, sorry, I'm just, I mean, yeah, I can answer your question because I just thought of something here. This is a good one. Like I believe like beliefs and cognitions influence uh, pain, but that's, and that's based on a few small studies. But if you, if you look at it and if you're really critical of that stuff, you're not going to see a lot of research showing that addressing those beliefs dramatically changes pain and function. We need that type of work. Mm -hmm. So we should be just as critical of our pain science ideas, like the words that we use, like people who think there's a, some paper came out in JSOPT about like words that are damaging. And one of them was like wear and tear or degeneration. I'm like, what's wrong with degeneration? There's nothing inherent. That's word is correct. Like we, we I think we maybe go too far sometimes. And mm. if like, if you put it this way, if you view the spine as robust and stable and the body capable of withstanding flexion and bending and twisting and different postures, then why don't you view the human psyche as robust and resilient and stable that can handle words like slip disc and degeneration and wear and tear? Yeah. Right. That's, that's my, like, there's an inconsistency here. 
you know, so that would be my knock on the pain science. Or like people would be like, oh no, you have all this muscle tension in your guarding that's bad on the spine. And I'm like, why would that be bad on the spine? You just told me the spine is strong that can handle 10,000 10, newtons of compression. Mm. Why can't it handle an extra 5% of muscle co-contraction? Yeah. We have these inconsistencies. That's, that's, what bo that's what bothers me in the pain science world. Yeah. We're very critical in some ways and then we just let some shit fly. <laughs> yeah, because it fits our narrative yeah. maybe. Yeah. I think patient, a lot of people can think that they have shitty posture and be pain free. I got the worst posture in the world. My spine's tilted. I got this scar tissue. How you doing? I feel great. Yeah. So you can you can have these like these negative beliefs. Yeah, they're not inaccurate, but they're not accurate, but they're not always unhelpful. No, and yeah. yeah. So they don't have to be at least. Yeah. So yeah. we should we should be just as critical of uh, our own leanings as we are toward. Yeah. Maybe maybe following that line of uh, thought, do you have uh, some kind of. Uh, specific frustration after being many years in the field working with pain and all the different discussions that are around that field uh so it's funny i'm, I'm kind of like removing myself from a lot of that stuff <laughs> yeah, but is that due to maybe because i got frustrated i don't know because if you if you go on twitter and see the discussions i have it's it's amongst people that Uh, are more similar to me. Mm. I'm talking to the people who are prescribing exercises and because they're so similar to me, I like to challenge them because I don't like their certainty. Like mm. this exercise has to be done like this and people need these things and load management is so important. Like everyone's like running injury. That one bothers me. You have all these people who want to be like rigorous clinicians and evidence-based and then people will say 70 to 80% of running injuries come from training errors. Or something like that. Everyone says that. I'm like, mm -hmm. where's the fucking research for that? Yeah. Or there's nothing. Or someone, some good clinicians will write a paper criticizing like shoes, like shoe selection, and then they'll say maybe we should we should be focusing on evidence based uh, interventions for running injuries, like training volume and load. And I'm like, where's the fucking evidence for that? Like we all, like every evidence based person does that. Or I just criticize. Sorry, now I'm in a roll. Yeah, that's good. There, there's this stretching, like, and I like these guys. They're good clinicians, but they wrote a, a stretching is a myth or something like that for running injury prevention. And 10, 15, like, I've always been anti stretching. Like, I was like, yeah, no shit. I wrote this fucking 20 years ago. Yeah, you guys are really ahead of the curve. <laughs> but, but then I saw them writing it and it's a myth. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go. And the past five years, I've been challenging my beliefs on stretching. I went through their papers that they cited in BJSM. So they cited two systematic reviews. Those systematic reviews didn't actually test whether stretching could prevent running related injuries. And then I read all of the papers in the systematic reviews and five of the papers, it was like in military recruits, not runners. And then in the two papers that really looked at stretching, it was one, one 15 or 20 second ankle stretch. That's it. That was the stretching intervention. And then we make this conclusion that it's a myth about stretching and running injury prevention where what we sh should be saying is it hasn't been adequately tested. Mm. because and because then they would and then their conclusion was people should be strength training instead and i'd be like what's the evidence for strength training and running injury prevention nothing i saw actually there's two papers they didn't show any results that they weren't that good so so should i now go out and say it is a myth that strength training can prevent running injury prevention i can't say that it's not a myth it's just untested mm. so that's what it means so people who are like me we are being not too critical, but we're being inconsistent yeah, so in critical our criticism. To some parts of yeah. the evidence and to a lesser extent of other parts. Yeah, so you're getting a lot of people just parroting and saying the same thing all the time. And although I'm very similar to those people, I'm like, why don't we turn our like critical eye on what we're saying as well? Yeah, and I, I yeah, can yeah. I don't recognize think we do it that, that well. in, in myself also because it fits the narrative of adaptability, for example. So why wouldn't strength training be a good idea of course if the individual want to do it and i wouldn't see the reason why static stretching would decrease the injury risk but that's not the same as there's evidence for say yeah it. yeah exactly so or that I, I, i understand where where they're coming from where if you actually this is amazing but if and some researchers like mayhew uh mcclure or not mcclure uh sorry uh McHugh, bam blazevich 
they've been writing for decades that static stretching before ballistic activities like sprinting will decrease your injury risk. Mm. And there's like a six papers or five out of these six papers show that. Yet everyone ignores those studies. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing like because it doesn't fit the narrative. And then this running injury one, they focused on that. I'm like, no, no, read that review again. That was for sprinting. Yeah. Like you, it was anyways. Yeah. Matter. And for what population and all that yeah. stuff that makes. Yeah. yeah we're too harsh word. like in our evidence yeah. base. We got it. It's nuanced and it's difficult. It takes more time. Go read all the papers in the systematic reviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To have a better view. Upon but this was in BJSM. And I was like, how did, how did this slide? Why, where are the reviewers here? Mm. It shocked me. Yeah, as the conclusion of the systematic review was it was an infographic that they did okay right and it was just parroting what we've been saying for 20 years like it's not new that stretching sucks so this is my career like i i, I was a contrarian about stretching 20 years ago and then and then six years ago i was asked to write a lit review on this for aspatar and I wrote, don't stretch, it sucks. And then I was like, you know what? I better really think about what I'm saying now. And I started reading all of it and I was like, shit, I don't think I can hold this opinion as firmly as I once thought I could. But couldn't you compare it to doing core exercises for back pain? Exactly. It's not that it doesn't work. It's just not any better than most yeah. other things you could do. Yeah, it's like people that say, don't stretch your Achilles or don't stretch your tendons. Why? Yeah. And you actually go and look at the research and there's nothing like Jill Cook with the uh, Australian Ballet. They have all these things saying don't stretch the tendon, and because they had a reduction in injuries when they added strength training and they removed stretching. And I'm like, well, yeah, you is it the addition of the removal? Yeah, you didn't no. test that. Oh, this is evidence based. I'm like, no, it's not. Hmm. You, got, it's probably because they started strength. Like, who, why wasn't the fucking ballet strength training? I, that was shocking to me. Like that, you just add that now. Like, what the hell? Yeah, that's a bit weird. Totally. But that doesn't mean don't stretch, but that's what we do. We get yeah. like our evidence are when someone's evidence based, they are they really like, or are they just critical towards certain things and not everything that they say? Yeah. And that's sort of my pet peeve yeah. with the pain science and of all course. Yeah, And it's difficult uh, because you kind of have all your biases and some of them you probably know and some of them you don't. You don't. Yeah. Who's your biggest professional inspiration? Um, I mentioned Jill Cooks, although I don't think she really likes me. I think her research is great because I, um, um, you know, I've been influenced by, probably, probably right now, you know, I love Peter O'Sullivan's work. I always have, I, mainly his career arc is so interesting. Mm, the shift or the, his is wonderful shift, mm. right? And, um, and just his ability to like, uh, uh, he gets great people to work with. You know, he's published hundreds and hundreds of papers now. And it's you know, like, I don't know if he helps develop these researchers, but the like uh, Sharton Vibe Fursum, you know, working with him a decade ago, that group, Kieran O'Sullivan, Mary, Mary O'Keefe, JP Canero, Samantha Bunsley, all, like just these like wonderful, just the team of researchers. Mm. So impressive. And I, he seems to be like that, the common thread there. So it's like, and I, I find their research like yeah there's RT rcts but they also put out like papers that you can read and say i'm gonna try to put this into my practice tomorrow so uh um uh and like i so it's pretty bad like i i <laughs> i i only met peter o'sullivan read their stuff like a few years ago maybe five or six but i realized i was on sort of the same path as then as them and it's very comforting to see someone like that doing mm. something like you're doing. So I'm a bit biased too. That's like, yeah, of course. Like some people will take my question, like, oh, thanks. I didn't learn anything, but just felt good to hear people say the same yeah. thing. And I, I feel that when I yeah, read I can really Peter O'Sullivan stuff, that. like, well, just makes you feel a little better. Like, yeah, of course. And I, then they improve. They improve what is your bias already, yeah. which is yeah. okay. I really felt that way going to your course and also going to Peter O'Sullivan's course. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. My, uh, mine's like a cousin to their course. It's the same yeah. uh, themes, but I'm more biomechanical yeah. and probably sportier or whatever. And I like the whatever. family, so yeah, it's fit family. my yeah, bias. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know that's bad, but you yeah. need that sometimes. Yeah, you do. So kind of to round it up, uh, what would uh, be maybe one or two recommendations uh, for a book people could read if they want to go more into what we've talked about today? 
that you would say is a good book? A book? Yeah. You know what? I, to be honest, I, I'm gonna go with something that you know might might surprise you. I would still go read like orthopedic textbooks. Um, you, you know, like uh, Chad Cook stuff or Mike Ryman's on like cl clinical testing. Because if you're gonna take this biopsychosocial approach, which always leans toward like exercise and beliefs and cognitions, the, when we every, when everyone says the BPS, we kind everyone kind of leans a bit toward the psychosocial. I would say say still keep your biomedical skills really sharp, mm. right? Like there are some there are shit there. There's conditions we've got to identify and get the help for. Like there that the bio is sometimes really important. And you never like, so as soon as you can rule out the nasty stuff or things that need help from someone else, like, like biomedically, boom, then you can do this comprehensive global approach. So still mm -hmm. be a good clinician. So yeah. I, that, that's the stuff that I would recommend people keep reading. And if you yeah. were to recommend also one book for the other part that you know what I, 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 I wouldn't recommend a book. I don't think that's out there. Okay. Um, maybe Greaves. Because Pete's in that, and Jeremy Lewis is in that. Greaves Manual Physical Therapy. I'm not sure what it's called. I have mm. it. I bought it. Um, what about Craig Scott? Liebenson's book? Mm -hmm. This is good. Uh, he brings in. I got a funny story that I can't tell online. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'll, hey, I'll hear it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about Scott? Craig? Tries. Craig's someone who's really tried to like uh, change through the years. He's kind of well. He's he's a bit weird because. Definitely a decade ago, he was into the biopsychosocial or more, maybe two decades ago. But then he was also very biomedical and kinesiopathological. And now he's shrugged that off when he's a movement optimist. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, so his probably he probably has some good people in there. Uh, no, I again, I would pick a pick a researcher like pick Pete O'Sullivan or JP mm -hmm. Canero. Um, well, Ma Mary more for RCTs, but JP or Darren Beals again, someone yeah, that's someone else that works with. Um, with Pete and uh, like just read their stuff from the past two years. Yeah. You know, just take a, a binder of 10 papers and, and they're all clinically relevant and you'll see threads in there and there's your book. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that was the next question people to follow, but that can be the answer for that. Uh, it, it depends on the area. Like if you give course. me a, a, an area of the body or a theme, I can give you research or some good at that. That makes sense. As an uh, ending for the episode, if you were to make a big sign for the community of practitioners working with pain, what were to be on that sign? Like a statement oh, or something to remember or... This, you know, don't, there's many like paths. There's, we can all disagree on things, on mechanisms of that, but a lot of us are doing the same thing, even though it seems different. That's why I brought up Ann Cools on purpose. Because mm. on the surface, she would seem very different from me or Peter O'Sullivan and that. Um, but I think, again, if you like, if you were mute and you couldn't hear what she said and you just watched the rehab, you're like, <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Right? So like, look, keep looking at people who are different from you and just find the common threads. Find that like, that... Um, active ingredient you know in in their rehab what what are they really doing that's helpful like don't don't turn your um mind off to to people who seem uh different like i would still take like a shirley sarman course um even though she's very biomedical and kinesiopathological and if your knee caves in your kneecap's gonna explode 20 years down the line because she was that group will still or kara lewis who used to work with it that group still has like skills on teaching people to move differently. There's still motor training skills that I could learn from there. Mm. I would just have a different idea of why yeah. I want to do but that. You could pick something totally, up from it. Totally. Yeah. Or One of the Jim Gill course or something so like that. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. I think that's a, a good way to, to put it. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, do you want to plug something at the end or? Um, I mean, I do, I, I do have my online course. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, this is, again, I am proud of this. <laughs> Because I think it's a good deal. Uh, um, and I want to see people in person and I want to provide good content that they always have. So my online course, which is like just at greglayman.ca or greglayman.thinkific, whatever. When people do sign up for that, you do get to take an in-person course in the future and use that as 100% credit. You just have to email me and I'll send you a code when you see it. And that'll be for probably the next two years or two years of buying it. I think that's pretty cool. 
I fully agree. <laughs> That's Maybe cool. I'm and I'll put myself. a link in the show notes so uh, you guys can find it there. And the videos are good. It's not like me at the front of a room just lecturing in front of people. I sat down, got a video editing software. There's B-roll. There's a soundtrack. You know. Sounds enjoyable. It's edited. It took hours. Fuck. I once did a three-minute video. It took me three hours to edit. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to put like cuts in there. Oh, to make it nice. It took that's forever. Good. It's not nice. It's just acceptable. Oh yeah, that's good. But get the acceptable course. <laughs> <laughs>